The UN is now calling on the fashion industry to become more sustainable. It's out with a new playbook challenging industry insiders to shift the way they communicate with consumers. The goal is to guide shoppers toward more sustainable style options. Our Karina Mitchell has more. According to a new United Nations publication, the global fashion industry is directly contributing to a trifecta of environmental crises, climate change, pollution, and nature and biodiversity loss. It actually is responsible from between uh, 2 and 8% of the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the textile processes consume around the equivalent of 86 million swimming pools per year of uh, natural water. Through creation of the recently launched Sustainable Fashion Communications Playbook, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the United Nations Environment Program seek to fundamentally shift current fashion messaging away from a linear approach to one that embraces circularity. It's one of the first documents that I've seen a very thorough discussion into the role that, that fashion plays not only in decarbonizing um, our, our materials, our supply chains, our entire industry, but also as, a, as an opportunity to connect with consumers. Primarily aimed at style marketers, brand managers, media and storytellers, its aim is fourfold, to introduce new messaging, countering misinformation and greenwashing, reduce overconsumption, promote more sustainable lifestyles and empower consumers to demand more action from businesses as well as policymakers. Tonda says a shift in consumer behavior could prove transformative. If we would transform our economy into a more circular one, and if we would have products staying in the economy and being used double the time, we will actually be reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. Footwear brand Allbirds was highlighted as a case study in the playbook for its transparency surrounding its carbon footprint. We've been calculating the carbon footprint from the start, even before labeling them in 2020. Uh, and then shortly after we started that, we released what's called our flight plan, the sustainability strategy that lays out very specific actions to decarbonize, reduce our per unit emissions in 50% by 2025. Nanushka, a contemporary fashion house, was another case study recognized for its use of digital QR codes on sewn-in labels, offering insight into the provenance of its products. We really try to give our customers more of an experience so that the idea is that if they feel more attached to that item, they will take good care of that and they will make sure that they can extend the life cycle of that product. Bertolani says more companies globally are recognizing the need to move toward fashion sustainability. In China, there are a lot of regulations when it comes to the chemicals that you can use on your products when you want to import some products there. U.S. focus more on like maybe the sourcing of the material. EU is really focusing on like climate change. Tonda says the biggest incentive for businesses may be the economics. A transformation by 2030 towards more circular business model is going to be responsible of $700 billion in economic value. Though the fashion industry has long been called out for its role in promoting overconsumption, one expert believes the timing is right for change. Today we see that there's so much practical guidance and research to support the industry making the move forward. And if not now, we, we really lose the opportunity um, that we have for uh, future generations. So this is the time. Karina Mitchell, CGTN, New York. Interesting. And let's take a closer look at just how the fashion industry is handling these calls for sustainability. Marcy Zerhoff is the founder and CEO of Eco Fashion Corp. And she's here to give us her perspective. Marcy, thanks very much. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. Uh, let's talk about some of the challenges that the global fashion industry is facing right now to be more sustainable. When you hear them all spelled out the way they were in Karina's story, you kind of get the sense, well, yeah, I kind of get why it's such a big deal. You consider everything that's grown, all the manufacturing, and then the process of putting clothes, shoes together. Uh, there's a lot of room. Yeah, you know, what people don't realize is a single garment can actually change hands 10 times in a supply chain. And every time that it's changing hands, there are more impacts, there are more markups, 
And when you look at the way that uh, major fashion houses or brands or retailers are buying, typically their uh, departments and their companies are very siloed and they don't talk to each other, marketing versus design mm. versus sourcing versus finance. And so the <laughs> systems inherently are broken and you need a holistic model to actually drive holistic and sustainable change. Do you think the industry is moving in that direction? I do. I've been doing this for three decades as someone who coined the term eco-fashion in mm. 1995. And I would say today more than ever before, everybody is jumping on the proverbial you know, sustainability uh, train. And it's no longer about staying ahead, it's about not being left behind. And we have a lot of major brands and retailers all over the world that are now joining the revolution for circularity, regeneration, and new technologies that are driving innovation in the supply chains. You know, Marcy, I think one thing that we always hear, no matter what field it is, when you talk about uh, making it more climate friendly, the economic incentives, because the bottom line has to make sense. Yeah, well, you know, you have a $3 trillion industry, and there's, like I said, a lot of inefficiencies, and 70% of the impacts are actually at the fiber and material level. So as companies are starting to source down at the farm gate or the raw material level and build up their supply chains, they're actually adding value without adding cost or they're being more efficient and they're being more relevant to today's consumers. So you can actually do well by doing good in the world. And there is a lot of opportunity that's untapped uh, by way of innovation. And some of the things that are underway right now are just getting started. It's interesting when you talked about 1995 earlier and the term eco-fashion. Back then you could just slap green on something <laughs> and it was attractive to the consumer, but that doesn't work anymore. Well, there are still, you know, stigmas from those days of, you know, crunchy, frumpy, boxy, beige, and boring, right? And, uh, you know, made from from materials that, uh, you know, were considered potato sack-like. Today, it's not about sacrifice or de deprivation. It's about no compromise. It's not why would you buy or, or make sustainable fashion. It's why wouldn't you? And today, there's so much pressure in the supply chains also at the retail level, at the government level, and at the consumer level. There's a convergence going on right now. So we do see that this is the beginning of, you know, new technologies, circularity and regeneration, sure. unlike ever before. This may be a bit unfair, but tell me about some of the brands that you believe are leading the way right now. Yeah, so I have a company called MetaWare, which does private label manufacturing for some of the biggest brands out there. We have a brand called Farm to Home on Kohl's, on Macy's, and on Costco. Uh, we also see brand partnerships with companies like Target and Madewell and Nike, Patagonia. Um, brands like Reformation and Mara Hoffman are definitely at the front lines. And I have a brand called Yes And Dot Style, which really sums up my mantra which is yes, you can have everything you want in the way of style and quality and price and have a way to make a difference to human and environmental wellness, farmer and worker welfare and future generations. You know, I really like the way you attack this with an unapologetic fashion. I mean, you know, no pun intended, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> people really are very cognizant of what they're doing today, whether it's flying, driving or whatever, and their wardrobe certainly is going to play a, a big part in that. Do you find there is a problem countering some of the misinformation out there? Yeah, there are, you know, those who are trying to take the lowest hanging fruits in terms of their efforts. And that sort of, uh, you know, leaves us all vulnerable to companies that are greenwashing, which ultimately compromises everybody. So today there's a big drive for transparency and traceability through blockchain technologies, all the way to QR codes on the, pro on the products. That, also, that not only give you the touch points of the product and the ingredients in the product, but also share ESG data, which is very important today. We're all, you know, facing the climate crisis. And today, you know, it's not about, uh, you know, doing less harm. It's about doing more good and looking at fashion actually as a solution for climate change. We have uh, an organization called the Textile Exchange that has a commitment industry-wide to reduce our collective carbon footprint by 45% by 2030, and all the biggest brands and retailers around the world are at the table, and yeah. everybody has to be. That's a, a, a great thing, but I think that so many consumers also remember seeing those reports about sweatshops overseas in developing nations, and the, 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 the pleas for big business, step in, take care of these people, and it simply didn't happen for a long time. Are you concerned that with all this greater action needed from business and policymakers, that 
you're going to see it again. Yeah, we're going to give it a lot of lip service, but in the end, you're going to get what we have. Yeah, I think accountability has, um, you know, taken uh, root in a way that it never has before. And that really is because of the digital age, right? We have technologies now that can prove out uh, certifications and traceability. Um, and, you know, today there are actually governments that are putting policies into effect. And the EU is at the forefront, but by 2026, there is going to be a requirement, a legal requirement, to disclose your supply chain uh, and be more transparent, as well as being held accountable to science-based climate targets. So I think, you know, from the standpoint of industry-wide accountability and, and pressure, it's always say cooperation, and also the consumer today being very discerning. They can be your best friends, but they can also be your worst enemies on social and digital media with organizations like Remake or the Fashion Revolution. Great. Marcy Zerhoff, thanks very much. We appreciate your insight. A lot to chew on there. Thank you. Thanks for having me.